Hello, and welcome to the Roll Wise Podcast. My name is Mike, and I'm here with my trusty friend, Brent. Say hello, Brent. Uh, hello. In trust, I say hello. Ah, in trust, he says hello. Uh, welcome to another week of our, of our trying to stay away from D&D, but not really succeeding. Um, as you may guess, the only reason we were going to talk about D&D this week is if something worse had happened. And right now, it's like we're in a dust settling. God only knows what's really going to be the outcome at this point. But, you know, Wizards of the Coast is obviously done. A fairly, a fairly large amount of damage to any trust and goodwill that they have with at least the creator community. The the normal role players, gamers, adventurers, and stuff like that may not have necessarily joined in on the the whole ruckus that you know happened over the last few weeks. But at least the the creator community and the creatives have have all kind of left, been left with a sour taste in their mouth. But uh, this yeah, week, the, there was also yeah, some drama. Yeah, the internet community has definitely been impacted by. Uh, what I would say is probably a large mismanagement of a situation. Maybe. Anyways, I mean, yeah. it's, it feels like it, you know, it feels like at this point, you know, the, the community reacted appropriately to a bad wizards thing. And there's some big content creators out there that are saying, you know, they, they, they jump on that bandwagon. And I think, I think this is the funny part about it is, is I think that everyone made wizards to be the villain in this. So anybody could say anything that painted wizards poorly and then the confirma confirmation bias would take over and pretty much you would just be like well yeah that that totally squares with how i feel about wizards right now they do sacrifice babies on the altar to to beezlebub let's you know, let's jump on that well, bandwagon <laughs> well yeah but, but part of allowing that to happen was that uh wizards didn't say anything uh they sent out the ogl and then just waited until you know, the volcano was burning, like Pompeii and everything before they were like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> well, let's, I don't even think they said, whoa, whoa, whoa. They were just like, you know what? We know that, that the, you know, people are trapped in ash and we get it. <laughs> and they said, and we all won with this disaster, um, which was another, like, I don't yeah. know who their PR person was, but like, that was, that was the stupid. That weird. was the, that was another stupid statement. Some people are going to say we lost. Well, we didn't. We all won. That's what? that's a dumb statement. Yes, we all won in our suicide pact. Great. <laughs> so Great. Like, that, that's yeah, how it that, usually that, goes. Some people are going to say we lost, but really, we all won. And it's like, that's not. No, you should just say we made some mistakes and then move on. Yeah, but so whatever. Whatever. So those of you that are following, I mean, really, it, it boils down to, you know, Watsi's put out some apologies, you know, kind of like we had talked about last week, we kind of expected them to put something out last Friday to address the, the growing concern for the community. They did. People, people righteously attacked what they had said as being deceptive. Seems as though there were some instigating insiders that kind of poisoned the well before any kind of marketing response could come out. And uh, as a as a new move, because I feel like I feel like they are trying to play you know four dimensional chess here. They put some guy named Kyle Brink, who's the executive producer of Dungeons and Dragons. Um, he's only been in the job, I guess, according to one of the videos I saw, like for four months or so, whatever, since October or something like that. So this this poor Kyle guy has been offered up as some sort of sacrificial lamb to the community because you know he's trying to add his voice to it and basically. It, it, you know, it's that perception thing, right? People perceive that there's some guy that has a position of authority over the overall direction of the game who's responding and basically spending his time with the community. And so that's supposed to be a good thing. And I think under normal circumstances, it would be. I mean, that's how, I mean, as, you know, businesses go, that's how you know something important's happening, right? I mean. Right. Well, definitely so. putting a face on it and not just seeming like a, a face, faceless megalith corporation was probably... Oh. Probably the new the one of the moves that needed to be done at this point, instead of looking like the, you know, the faceless meat grinder machine that's just rolling over content creators, putting a smiling face on it being, hey, guys, I think we need to talk is probably a yeah. good move, I would say. Putting a name and a person behind the the responses is probably best. Um, it, well, so it's, it's good, a smart move. Good, good move, finally, as opposed to whoever, you know 
whoever was writing the original press releases that yeah definitely didn't so. seem to know who <laughs> definitely didn't seem to know <laughs> you didn't win we won well you kind of won too probably isn't what you should be putting in press releases about your company being on fire <laughs> <laughs> no, but well, they they definitely rolled in that one, and they changed their uh, <laughs> they changed they changed their approach again, which is fine. And I mean, it, but as for what they said about the new OGL, I mean, if if this is what forced their hand away from that kind of draconian, you know, previous version that they had, I, it's good. It is definitely good, and it sounds like according to what they're writing, I mean, I I haven't looked at the OGL, and I'm sure that there are going to be some lawyerly types is lawyerly is that a real word yeah lawyerly is now types that lawyerly. are going to be uh reviewing this and hopefully they happen to have kind of a background in intellectual property to kind of i mean and i hate to qualify that you know any lawyer can look at this and obviously give their two cents but it is always nice when a, a person that specializes in that field takes a look at it and says well while this may be construed by a standard lawyer as being a little weird it's actually boilerplate speech for this type of thing you know what i'm saying like this type of property this is this is industry standard so you wouldn't feel that D D was trying to be sneaky or weird if that makes sense right or screw its content <laughs> creators out of everything they've worked hard for which seemed kind of like allegedly yeah. there's a good allegedly, word, allegedly. <laughs> they were allegedly were trying to do before um no yeah. like I'm, I'm glad they walked it out i mean they did walk back the ogl stuff a little bit um one of the things like I, I was we were telling you before we started the podcast is I would I would advise everybody to keep an eye out because I think the end of the line, um, the stuff that they had in the OGL is where they want to go. Um, and so, you know, just just remember that when you're publishing your third person stuff, um, mm -hmm. you know, I think that's where they want to go. If they want to make sure they own every it all. And I, so I think you'll probably see little adjustments. I was going to look into my Brent's crystal ball. Um, I would say they're probably going to try and make little adjustments to get as much close to that, that document as they can over the next, before they release um, whatever the hell well, they D &D. call sixth edition. <laughs> yeah. Whatever they call um, it. So, so before we dive into the, the mystery that we were going to talk about this week, because it's because just so everybody knows the actual, the actual subject of this episode is actually us doing a little bit of a postmortem on our first vase in mystery, um, which was fun. It, uh, you know, so me being a, me being the guy who ran it and Brent being one of the players, uh, you know, we got to kind of experience the vase in system and kind of get, uh, one of their pre done, um, you know, one of their pre done scenarios or mysteries or whatever, whatever you want to call it. And so we're going to give that to you in just a moment. But there was one thing that I was curious about. And I think this is kind of something that whether or not this actually happens, I mean, it sounds like right now you have conflicting information, you know, uh, Wizards is saying that they're not going to do this. But one of the things that was mentioned at some tweet in this entire thing was that, you know, AI DMs was a concept that you know, wizards might be exploring as a way to cover the shortfall of DMs in the D and D hobby. Now, what's interesting about our group is that out of all the players that we have, because we have a, a strong collection of about, I would say, what do you think? We have five people that typically are in our group. Is that what you'd say? Yeah, yeah. And I think of those five, I think only one doesn't DM. Uh, think, yeah, that's, I think that's, that's, that's probably that's probably correct. And so I think that I think that speaks to like kind of a healthy group is that everyone's willing to kind of take turns because I I really don't ascribe to the idea that somebody has to be relegated to the quote unquote forever DM spot. That's that's kind of silly in my opinion. But I think if you really enjoy the DMing position and you want to do that, like I do, I you know I am going to I'm going to go to Sid and say DM until you want to take a break, and I. I'm happy that my group can get together as often as I can, but other groups are, haven't have proven to not be so lucky. And I think that there's a variety of reasons, you know, things from kind of players being a little bit, I don't want to use the word narcissistic because that sounds crazy, but having just insane character concepts that they want to insert into some world. And then the DM has to kind of like work around this. 
Um, but also just the amount of prep work that a typical D and D dungeon master has to undergo isn't easy for someone who wants a game on the go because a player just has to show up, maybe review some notes from last session, whereas a D and a dungeon master has to do fucking everything, right? Right. You are the grand arbiter. You are the one that knows the rules. Um, if there is anybody who doesn't remember anything, um, you know, you're the one that's going to have to remind them then, you know, eventually, you know, everything like that. So, yeah, mm-hmm. um, you know, that's the thing is GM is the is the uh, what the ocean that lifts the water that raises all boats. How does that saying go? Uh, high tide raises all boats, all ships. Yeah, they're the high tide. That's what I was. That's that's it. And as people have seen, a good DM can really alter the experience of all the players and so forth. Now, what it, what's, what is interesting is that the idea that an AI DM could be an... Because, like, I mean, obviously, Wizards has a few different things that they could do. I mean, if you know what I think would be really interesting is if Wizards offered workshops for DMs. Like, how do you do this? And either, even if this was just you know, on-demand workshops that weren't like actual workshop workshops, you know, you could go into this library of content where they say, hey, you know, this is what you do. And there are people that do this already on YouTube, so it may not be a thing that they need to worry about. But it's like, if they want to help, but it's like, well, how can you, as the official promoters of this game, help your community be better DMs, right? Because you, if you just want to start D&D, you're not going to know to go, oh, I need to go watch... A, a content creator like Jenny D or somebody like that, you're going to be like, well, what the fuck do I even search? Right. right. So, and they have uh, newsletters yeah. and stuff, but you know, that's one thing. Yeah. It is something that they do already conventions. Um, they probably should. Um, mm-hmm. They probably should have some sort of, even if they had their own, like they should probably have their own. I mean, I, I know they have their own YouTube channel, but they definitely should have, dm workshops and advice on their own youtube channel um where you can mm-hmm. look that's definitely true um well, and and you know because again, it's kind of like what we talked about before um really quick where they don't do much to really build on their gm community it's more mm-hmm. kind of like how do we maximize player community who yeah. you know statistically aren't the people that are buying all the books and stuff so well and so the other thing is is that it's like you know and what i always think is funny is that for a a company that specializes in gaming i bet you there are a ton of people that would buy into some sort of D &D gamification of of gm skill sets i swear to you i bet that that would be a thing (laughs) you know what i'm saying like oh i'm gonna and i and i think they've done stuff like that in the past to more limited like not it hasn't been following like a lot of the principles of, of gamifications but it's been like you've earned badges or some shit and maybe they do it now and maybe i just don't know that they do it because i didn't read that section of the internet but that would be curious to see if that if they've gamified you know your your advancement as a gm in some way that gms can feel like they gained something not necessarily resume worthy but something right so yeah i'm sure um yeah i mean that would be interesting i'm sure there's there might be a community somewhere but i i don't know not really like i think a lot of times people like i don't know how often professional gms other than on youtube give advice to each other yeah that's kind of interesting that's interesting concept yeah well and i've obviously you know because we we're not the we're we're not necessarily the go-to guys yet. It'd just be something that I would. It would be fun to see that that kind of thing happening. But the alternative would be is just say fuck the DMs and then invest in some sort of AI system, which is could not be true. It might be true, might not be true. You know, it's it's hard to really say because I mean, there's there's a few different things, and I think that this is this this comes to the heart of the social nature of this is how do you how do you keep DM how do you keep Dungeons and Dragons as the social community game without it turning into a video game if you have the AI DM option. And what I think is interesting is that an AI DM could be the most convenient thing because, you know, like, let's say it was just you wanted to do a one-on-one game, you know, solo style. Now you've got a game. It just happens to be a different type of video game. (laughs) And, And I don't know if I would feel as fulfilled playing it that way. But what do you think about 
that AI component to it. Um, I think it's interesting, but I think you're getting away from it being a role playing game. Um, cause like D and D and, and other role playing games have always been for me about like telling stories with a group of my friends and that would be getting farther away from that of having the AIGM. Like if, I guess if I wanted to do that, I would just probably, I personally would probably just go play a video game with a couple of my buddies instead of trying to, like you said, work through an AI who might not be super responsive, depending how well the AI machine is. Um, yeah, and it definitely wouldn't laugh at any of my bad jokes. So I don't think that would get me the serotonin drop that torturing you with my jokes and comments do. So, um, yeah. And, and it, it, cause it is interesting to me. Cause I think that, you know, chat GPT and some of these other AI technologies have really surprised me as to their maturity and their advancement and stuff like that and how well they've done. And I, and I think that there's probably something out there because obviously if AI can master chess and now go and all these other, you know, higher brain level game theory type games, it, it doesn't seem impossible for it to eventually master something like simple D and D. But I think the fact that you can go anywhere with D and D makes it really challenging because it's, I mean, as we said before, you know, like, how do you, like, let's say you go, okay, well, we're going to play through the, this lost minds of Fandelver. Um, you have a, a party of four people and they decide spontaneously to be murder hobos and they decide to kill every, everybody in the first set town of like Fandolin, right? <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, well, how does the AI deal with that? Does it know how to go off script? And then, I mean, maybe it's better at dealing with it than a human is because that human is going to be like, you guys are a bunch of bastards. Like, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> you know, and try to steer them back on. Whereas maybe the AI just leans into it and says, you are now an evil game. And then it just takes you down this evil path. I don't know, man. <laughs> so. Well, I guess that's the other, like, man, I don't even want to get into the ramifications of, uh, AI murder simulator becoming a thing that people start to use for, for, uh, role-playing games. Like, like, I don't want to, like, that's another thing. Like, somebody will have to, like, there'll be somebody monitoring that stuff because I'm sure that there's content that they're not going to want to happen on their AI servers, which gets into a whole other privacy, like, privacy yeah. situation that's probably way beyond anything that we want to discuss is like, oh my God. Like, because, because you, yeah, like, like I, I hadn't even thought of that until you said that. And it's like, oh God, what, like, somebody, what did this turn into? <laughs> debasing the a the ai's role-playing game and somebody has to step in and be like you can't you can't do that on our, our servers and it's like oh my god because <laughs> you know you you know Brent, i do know Brent. i know for a fact <laughs> i know i'm a, i'm a hundred percent agreeing with you i know 100 percent for a fact um like well it's just like the game that we talked about like way back in the episode about reddit like that one guy that said i ran a game where you know it was a truly horrible campaign where they were like murdering children and stuff like that it's like mm -hmm. there you go there's the there's there's what there's what your your ai gm is gonna have to deal with probably more often than you'll ever be comfortable with probably and what if it what if it gets into kink you know like what like torture all these kind of things like you know because sometimes people you know, want to role play that out, I'm sure. And right. Like, see, we'll like see. there's I don't know. They should stick to they should try and make more human GMs who can corral the madness a little bit because I just I don't know. Like I don't know, maybe it'd be a good thing, but I, I just I, I don't know. For me it seems I would have I would probably try it um and see what it was like, but I can't it just wouldn't have the social element that's important for me and role playing in, in role playing games with my friends. Like that was always, you know, as mm -hmm. a person that doesn't, you know, doesn't drink or smoke or any of that stuff, like games are one of those way of things that have always been social to me. So like taking that out of it, it was hard enough, like transitioning away from being in person to just role playing over like different chat programs and stuff like that. Like it still feels mm -hmm. like it's missing something for me sometimes. Sure. Um, so I can't even believe just removing, like, it would be hard for me to just remove a person from the table and be like, okay, robot, tell me a story about Fandelver and what we're going to do today. 
Well, I mean, I, maybe we can't imagine it because we're so old, but I... I maybe that is it. <laughs> maybe maybe that's the future and there'll be... It'll be like a brave new world with robot GMs teaching kids how to play games. I don't know. Tell me a story, um, Mr. Storybot. Tell me a story. <laughs> right. And I, and I and, it, and and to me, I think it would also like we talked about this a little bit, but I think it'd feel like kind of like Gloomhaven, like just kind of like it doesn't really. If you do something crazy, it really doesn't handle it very well. Um, but if you, you know, if you play within the parameters, you know, it's I a go fun down the game, hallway. but it's yeah, it's a fun game, but it's definitely not a role playing game. Is what I would say about like Gloomhaven, I, and I, I think it would probably start to feel like that, where you have cool descriptive text. But it's still going to be scripted stuff happening. Yeah, you kind of like you're, and you know what is it? It's kind of like when you, uh, if if you play like a video game, you know, you you don't necessarily role play, and, and even in things like Mass Effect, I guess you kind of do. But you know, when you're playing like Final Fantasy and stuff, there's not really a lot of decision choices. You just you just have skill tests, and you just kind of play through the game, right? Right. <laughs> so Right. And yeah, I and I, mean, I feel like that's and I feel like that's what it would it would feel like. Um yeah. and while like you with a real GM you might be able to run a game like even if you ran like like we're gonna segue into this in a minute, the Vason game. Mm -hmm. Like even if I was with a different party and we ran that game again, I may have some idea as to what might be going on, but we could run that game again at, with me in the party and I'm not really impact the game because you could change things um mm -hmm. and i feel like yeah. that's going to be a little bit different with an ai but but according to gw they're not working on it according to gw they like their human gms too much De debbie watsi <laughs> yeah the other the other evil uh gaming corporation sorry not gw uh wizards of the coast <laughs> Yeah, um, poor GW. It's just like all these people are like, "Oh, damn you, GW!" And it's just like, well, no, it's, for some reason, we're more hated today than yesterday. But... Well, it's like that cartoon I shared with you, where it was like, yeah. uh, it was like Marge going, "Damn it, GW!" And GW walks up behind her, and goes, "What?" And she goes, "Oh, sorry, force of habit." Wizards of the Coast, get over here. <laughs> um, yeah, pretty much. Like pretty I said, much. I don't really worry about GW getting into any of these uh, technology stuff because they. They seem to not care about that very much, but yeah, they, they only the make Coast, models. That's yeah, it. Wizards of the Coast definitely is said that they they definitely in their release said that they are not working on AI right now. So yeah, which is fine. I, it's just I, it maybe it's like one of those we're not working on it unless we're working on it. You know, I don't know. We're not, not working on it. Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Well, um, we're not working on AI, thing. but we do have this thing called Project. Faroon? Hmm? Project is... Munchausen. <laughs> you know, some something like that. Like, Because I could see that being like a code name of a secret project where they're analyzing the opportunity behind it, but whatever. But that's, let's project, talk about... Uh... Project Skynet. And that's how D&D that's &D ruins the entire world. That's the future right there. Project Skynet. At, uh, Wizards We'd of the be Ghost. lucky if the, if the AI that D&D &D produced was the... Like and then it just turned into like some sort of death game for all of humanity going forward because it's just like oh you wanted to role play well let's play how you survive you know the real I started watching the Alice in the Borderlands the, the real Terminators all look like elves from Wizards of the Coast um, no. Alice in the Borderlands it's an excellent show yeah because because I, I I do have to say that there's definitely a lot of a lot of focus on death games in in Japanese entertainment for some reason there is. Japanese and Korean entertainment, you're, yeah, there is. Um, it's kind of interesting. Um, so, and that, that's what it's one of the AI. It, it's one of those things that seems like a, an actual subconscious fear that people are going to be abducted and put in a uh, <laughs> put in a survival game. This is a weird thing that you guys think is going to happen, maybe? Or maybe maybe they're just hoping for something to snap them out of the, the their mundane life, you know, and the, and that's a perfect thing as a death game where you have to actually feel something, because <laughs> that's true. That would that would definitely do it. It would definitely change change who you are on a very uh, a very core level. That's for sure. Yeah, kind of looking to shake the on way out of it or something. I don't know. 
but much like much like uh being uh captured by nordic fairies and um abducted by them and being able to see them in the future there's your segue into our vase and mystery uh so game so here's so here's the first thing I want to do before we really get into this next section is that there are going to be spoilers for the pre um, for the written campaign Her- uh, Silver of the Sea. Um, so if you are playing that game and you want to and you happen to stumble upon this post, uh, it don't don't listen to what we say here because there could be enough spoilers in here that you know you haven't. You know, you have a different experience than what you should, and it could also frustrate the the whoever is running your sessions and stuff like uh, that. I was just gonna say, if you really want to cheat the GM and know what's going on, just keep listening. We'll probably give you enough information it, to be able to do that. Well, if you if you want to do that too, that's fine. You can listen away, <laughs> but but that just seems like you're only cheating yourself. He says from his high horse, uh, glasses <laughs> down, uh, glasses yeah. down, staring at you over his glasses unapprovingly. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. So, uh, so Vason, in terms of like the mystery, um, so what was what was interesting is I thought that you know using just standard mystery tropes, um, you can you can kind of like rate how this mystery went, um, and by a few different a few different topics. And I think we're going to kind of take these topics kind of as in you know from and and I kind of looked at just kind of an organizational thing. I looked at the 10 essentials from masterclass and I thought that was a good thing to kind of say, Hey, this is, this is, a, these are at least good talking points to kind of follow from an outline. So in terms of the, the mystery, you know, it's like the hook. And I thought was, what was interesting about this one is that, you know, I mean, first of all, with Vason, I really like how they just kind of, they give you a hook in the form of you get summoned via like a letter, you know, this is obviously 19th century Sweden. So, you know, people have heard of the society or they know or they have connections to the society somewhere in the past and they send you some sort of correspondence to say, hey, you know, we know you look into the weird shit. Can you help us look into this weird shit? And because everybody likes looking into weird shit, you kind of go, right? You're kind of like the private private investigator who, you know, the damsel walks through the door and says, I have a job for you kind of thing, right? And, right. I, and I like that. Right. And I guess in this case, uh, I did use a prop. And I was curious, like, what were your thoughts um, from having the prop kind of open the game up? The letter prop? Yeah, because I, I had, like, there was an audio recording that some other creator had, had shared well, the freely. Audio recording, the audio recording was really good. Um, I like those sorts of, I think the audio recordings are kind of neat. I like props to add to a game, so I thought that was good. The letter, like the physical picture of the letter that you shared, mm-hmm. um, I thought that was a little like I had a hard time reading it to be honest. Um, like the way the font that they chose to write mm-hmm. the um, to write the letter in was a little difficult for me. Um, but I thought the I thought the audio recording was really good. Yeah, and so I think if uh, if I'm going to be able to name the creator here, I think this was by One Shot Adventures. Um, I think he, he was the one on YouTube that um, put out a something to basically um, to put out that extra little bit of a little bit of uh, props and stuff like that. So big shout out to him and basically making that available to have a professionally voice acted prop to uh, to share. So I thought that that I thought you know I I felt like that was a great way to get everybody engaged and into the game and it sounds like you did too it's just that the actual prop that came with the adventure was written in kind of some weird cursive and I think that when you look at it I I felt like it was hard to read like so. it was hard to read yeah that would that would be my one thing too is I did feel like like the audio recording was was great I enjoyed the audio recording but yeah like the actual like that's the problem with props, right? Is they want it to look like somebody's handwriting. Well, sometimes people's handwriting is Garbage. not easy to read. <laughs> and um and all of us old people, while we may know how to write in cursive, uh and read and, and read cursive if it's, you know, distinguishable, um, it's still not something they read every day anymore. So it's it's a little difficult. Mm-hmm. Um so yeah, but the auto recording was great. Like I like yeah, so- props like that. So I felt like the the auto recording and kind of the the hook set up for the next part, the atmosphere of the game, which was, you know, it kind of it kind of gave you that let's go investigate 
and let's go to, you know, let's go solve this mystery that has been presented kind of feel to it. Now, the question about the atmosphere after you arrived at the, the thing was that, you know, you're supposed to be coming to the uh, a booming fishing township, effectively, called Fjallbaka. And you're supposed to get the impression that the, the township was, you know, itself it, it definitely wasn't uh, on the downslope because, you know, obviously the silver of the sea was there. And so people were making hand over fists over a, a commodity that land lovers like ourselves are, are not going to really be familiar with. But, you know, the fishing village with a lot of fish tends to be a prosperous place, right? Mm -hmm. Um and so I think I, I don't think the atmosphere was too far off. I thought the atmosphere was good, but it seems it seemed like it was a lot brighter atmosphere to start with. And I'm curious, did you is is that how you would like to start a mystery in your case, or do you feel like it's better to start with kind of a more foreboding mystery? So even though this place is kind of still good, you know, like it's prosperous, but it's like but everyone walks around with a chip in their shoulder kind of thing. <laughs> I think the I think the I think the environment was good. Um I think that I think that worked out fine like because the idea uh was that you know like it was just something that happened and people weren't necessarily enamored of the guy that it happened to um in the first place. So um again spoilers like people really didn't care if the priest was around. So mm -hmm. I think it being like kind of upbeat was fine. I think I was fine for this adventure. The part, the, the 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 trouble I had with the hook, um, as soon as my character realized it, because my character's kind of dumb, uh, was again it wasn't about necessarily um investigating Faison. It was about investigating a murder, um, yep. which that seemed a little bit weird because it's like, well, we're like the moment that somebody told my character there's no Faison really involved. This is about a murder. He was kind of like, well, we're not cops. Why are we here? <laughs> well, um, it wasn't necessarily that there were no Vason involved. It's just that the 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 hook was more of a of a very very much more about a murder that had happened. So the murder itself, you know, for for those that are keeping with us, is that you know a vicar was found washed up on a nearby shore, bullet to the alleged head, murder, an, apparent, an alleged murder, an apparent suicide, really, an apparent suicide. Now, everybody, you know, believed that it was a suicide because, you know, it looked like he basically shot himself. And for trigger warning, I should have said that beforehand. And for anybody that deals with this stuff, you know, obviously we're dealing with murders, death, all that kind of thing. But um, in terms of like, you know, the reason why you're there is because his protege basically is under the impression that there's no way that that could have happened. And the circumstances leading up to his untimely death seemed to more indicate foul play. He just wasn't really sure how it could have been foul play, right? So I think that from a, I'm a from a crime itself standpoint, I think that's one of the ways that you can kind of tie it back into it is because you think to yourself, well, there's no way that he would have committed suicide, so how could he have, how how was he killed and what kind of explanation you have? And sometimes that explanation might lean towards something more supernatural than not, right? And I think that's why... Until we got to the... Like yeah, until we got to the town, there wasn't anything to indicate that, though. Like, it was much mm -hmm. later, like, in our investigation that that kind of happened, and that was more when our... Like, and I guess that I guess that maybe one is one place that maybe I got lost with the rest of the party is, like, they became super focused on investigating the murder itself, when maybe we should have been trying to investigate what we're, you know, there for, which is trying to find out if there's any vase and involvement which we definitely found like we definitely found that there was some some sort of supernatural element to it we just seemed to not focus on it at all we just kind of ignored it and we're like that guy's weird or whatever and then <laughs> like kind of went on let's go find people suspicious you know yeah um and so so here's it so here's the question is that because you know like that's what it because it, it you're asking yourself like you know, because the quality, because like the crime itself was that there was a guy who had been, you know, died in apparent suicide and you're there to prove otherwise, right? That you're there to prove that it wasn't a suicide. And so, you know, when you're looking at possible suspects there, I mean, it was a, the problem I think that you run into is that, you know, from like a, a red herring standpoint, there really wasn't a lot of like 
red herrings to to work through here. There was there was a little bit, right? Because, you know, when you get to the actual idea is that, you know, the, the surprise here is that he did actually kill himself. You know, he did shoot himself in the head. And you're thinking to yourself, oh, okay. What? You know, you know, you kind of have that like, well, wait, I'm not really sure, but it, it comes, he basically shot himself in the head under duress, right? And so there were, he was going to be sacrificed to this mermaid that was, that basically is the one who was, you know, calling the herring to ensure that this Wrecker Isle and Village of Falbaca was prosperous. And so instead of taking that, that death, he took a different death of his own choosing, which means he shot himself in the head. So in in reality, there really wasn't a crime in that sense. You know what I'm saying? Like he killed himself under duress, but it wasn't like I mean. So the so the the fact that he killed himself was the he I mean that was true. Like he didn't he what like the the Amundsens who were the main villains of the character really didn't kill him because they didn't have a chance to. So it's very strange in that way, right? So, and what did you get? What did you think of the Amundsens? Were they were they the appropriate villains for your first time in Basin, or do you feel like they were? No, I think they were good. They definitely stood out as potentially like the suspects, um, which I think is good. Like we kind of knew who we had to talk to. Um, I think they were good villains. Um, I liked the the twins, Pace and Peter, Peter and Pace. Like well, I thought, I liked that. The the tough part about that was is that that was one of the clues is they were actually not twins they were basically triplets they were part of a set of three, do you remember that? Right, like the third guy was supposed to be a tri- one of them too, but he didn't look anything like him. Right? No, no, no. There were three. There were there were three of them, and then there was Zacharias, and I don't think anybody picked up on that clue. I think we all thought they were twins. Well, no, the, the, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think anybody picked up on that there was supposed to be a third one. No. But, and, that's my, and that's my point, is that because it, in the introduction to it, basically there is, you found out the father had died under mysterious circumstances and Zacharias had taken over the business and was running it with grandmother Abela. But then there were the muscle of the, the family. There was Pete, Paul, and Pace. And you guys only ever saw Pete and pace paul was never anywhere to be seen and that's because he was the one who was sacrificed in place of the vicar and so there was that thread and i tried to you know i was trying to figure out how i could get you guys to kind of pull at that because i think that would make it more apparent as to what was happening but it just seemed like you guys had kind of missed that somehow in the in the clue giving for some reason i thought i thought that yeah, I, I thought there were only three brothers. I didn't. I didn't pick up on the fact that there were four. Yeah. Um, and I don't think. And maybe that's because no, no one like everybody else just went with it. Mm-hmm. Um, um, yeah, I definitely didn't pick up on that. Even so when you I describe, think that's... describe the picture, mm-hmm. right? There was a because there was a picture in the study that had the whole family, right? Yep. And, and I remember I you like... saying something, but it didn't dawn on me that the third brother, for some reason, like I said, I thought there was something weird about the third brother not looking like the other two and them supposed, like, I remember you saying it's triplets, but I thought there was something weird about him not looking like the other two. So I think, I think we all kind of thought he'd been replaced or something, not, or like changed by his, like changed by his experience with the basin. I don't mm. think we all, I don't think any of us figured out that there was actually a third, per, like a third brother we were supposed to know about. If that makes yeah. sense? It does. Um, and I think. But, again, this is one of the weird things that players do is like, they make weird leaps of logic that don't make sense sometimes. <laughs> like, so, you can explain it to the best of your ability. And sometimes it's like, how did you guys get to that conclusion? I don't know. Oh, we God. just kind of, we just kind of all went with it. <laughs> So, so needless to say, I think, you know, I think in the terms of clues and everything like that, there were, there were a lot of clues and ultimately you and you as investigators were going to find out that, you know, the Amundsen's were sacrificing people on a, on a monthly basis to coincide with the new moon. 
you would find out that the the vicar actually killed himself, but that was to save himself from a fate worse than death. Um, not not exactly sure what happens when a person sacrificed to a mermaid. I kind of assumed that they just get taken down for sex slave stuff. I don't know. A life um, of wonder, wonder. Yeah, it, well, they actually get a they get to live a better life under the sea, or something. Um, and I'm not going to bust out in a song. They have to listen to that goddamn lobster sing that song over and over again. That's what it's like, right? Right? Yeah, that's that's what it's like. But but for our purposes, we're not going to sing any lobster Disney songs. Because uh, no, we'd, we'd also probably run into problems with the uh, with YouTube if we actually sang the song. So, although it'll yeah. probably sound so bad that no one would bother like flagging us. For YouTube it. would be like, "What is this?" Uh, no, um, but I think <laughs> that there were plenty problem? of other cues. Yeah. And there are plenty of other uh, yeah. things like you guys, it took a little while, but you guys didn't really catch on until like the very end about the gun. Um, you guys did catch out about like the crucifix and the fact that like the vicar was, you know, arguing with somebody that could have been Zacharias Amazon. You know, you guys, you guys got all the pieces and everything like that together, but I don't think anybody actually like got it's like when we got to the end of this story because we did have a time crunch on it and i think you guys did good to kind of get as many pieces of the puzzles before the the crime bit but i don't know if i would necessarily say it had a satisfying ending because i don't i don't feel like you guys totally understood what was happening and well, I mean, you got to, until you got to i mean I, I think it got to the point where the moment that there was an objective, which was rescue the girl, like, mm -hmm. like all thoughts of us, like solving the mystery, basically were gone. Like we, we, we turned into the regular adventuring party where it's like, well, let's just rescue the girl. Um, and so I would say, I would say for finale, like it worked, it worked great. Like we, we did it. We rescued the girl. So we all felt like there was a sense of accomplishment by doing that. Like mm -hmm. we did a good job in that, but. And I don't even know if, like, have you asked anybody else how they felt about solving the mystery? Not, not yet. I still have to, I still have to get in touch. Because, like, because, like, I felt pretty fulfilled by rescuing the girl. And to be honest, um, for like my character, like that would that that was a good enough like resolution, um, because of my character is like, oh yeah, they they did it. Um, yeah, they killed him. Sure. Um. And if they didn't kill him, they were going to kill him. But we rescued the girl, so we're all good. Like, so my characters, yeah, and we saw we saw a mermaid. Like, that's, uh, you know, further proof facing exists, check. So, mm -hmm. like, he's good with it. As far as me, like, when at the end I was like, oh, well, I'm glad we rescued the girl, but we definitely didn't solve the mystery. And for me, I don't know, like, I felt I felt pretty satisfied with the end. Like, um, even though we didn't solve the, we didn't really solve the mystery. Like, I felt like my character achieved everything he would have wanted to achieve about that because he really didn't he really didn't care about the murder very much he cared about the vase and, and then cared about saving the girl at the end like so mm -hmm. from for my character it was pretty fulfilling so from that sense the sense of my character and for me i think it worked i think it, i think it was fulfilling yeah but i mean and that's and that's sometimes what you have to do is you have you you can have steps in your victory conditions because i think i would have felt more satisfied had you actually solved the murder and come to that kind of epiphany and conclusion, I feel like the the adventure as written has some very strange, um, very strange leaps in logic that it has to try to have you make. Um, and so I tried to insert those leaps in logic, you know, so that rather than necessarily you guys, um, you know, just like because I think one of them is just supposed to be like somebody roll a learning check to suddenly remember everything about mermaids, and you're like, how, contextually, how would that fit like <laughs> well you, you know. like I, I i think i think that's in there for like players that just aren't getting it definitely just mm -hmm. aren't getting it like which i can see happening like i think in this case you did a good job presenting us with clues that we just blew past like like me and the guy talking like that was like telling me about the full moon and i just kind of oh wow that guy's weird and then just like went about my day um and i'm, I'm gonna blame like the holidays and us missing some game sessions for that but um but like it, that definitely was one of those things where a re like if we we probably should have investigated that a little bit more i think one thing that this adventure did well 
as far as a mystery is kind of after I talked to you about it and I thought about the clues, I think there was at least enough to where like a real mystery, we could have solved it before mm-hmm. the climax, um, which the last mystery that we played, the, the Delta Green game, quote unquote mystery, the uh, the game with the traveler. Um, yeah, that def- I, that did, that was not a mystery. Like there was no way we were ever going to identify what was going on. Like we could figure out what was going on, but we were never going to solve the mystery before the end game. So I think this was better written as a mystery, and I think you did a good job mm-hmm. presenting it. It's just hard. It's it's the it's the thing that's hard about like that makes both role playing playing both both interesting and frustrating, right? It's like how can I compensate for the players either not knowing or mm-hmm. not doing kind of what they're supposed to do? Well, um, because I, I mean, definitely. Go ahead. Because I mean, we could have done it the other way and just showed up and said, "Yep, the Amundsens look guilty," and just started pointing fingers at them, like right away. Like, so you mm-hmm. don't really want to like make it overly obvious that it's them either, because the, the players will do that. Like, they will just jump well. to, "Oh, they're obviously bad. They're obviously the people that did it." Let's just say it's them. Like, they have they have the guns. Let's just start telling people that they murdered somebody. Like, well, and then it's like, oh well, you don't need any of the clues because they happen to guess right well and that and that's i think so there are two components that i think were a little bit tricky on this one because first of all you're you're promised a game about supernatural and nordic core and i don't i don't feel like this one was necessarily as strong in the supernatural and nordic core you'd, you'd have to work at it a lot more because basin were so were were the main issue but they were also tangential to like why you were called out because you again you were called out to solve a murder or an attempted suicide you're there to prove disprove that rather than necessarily saying like you know we have this you know grim that comes out at night and we need somebody to help us understand how to get rid of it and then you solving the mystery of the grim right this one was solving the mystery of the vicar's death Right, or like there's something that's murdering things. It's probably not human. Who in the town is it? Like a werewolf mm-hmm. sort of mystery, like identifying who the werewolf is. Like that that seems more like a Vason mystery to me. This was, like I said, this being a, a crime, like a murder solving one, like Vason were involved, but I, I, I would say they weren't the focus of this. Like it was definitely the murder mm-hmm. was the focus of this adventure, which was a little weird. And then yeah. like my character ran into a problem of like, okay, like, even if we know who it is, like, what are we supposed to do with that information? Like, okay, we solved the mystery. Like, do we just tell Otto, like, yep, they, your friend did kill himself, but it's their fault. Like, that, like, the, the, for me, when I got there, and maybe one of the other people would have had a better idea, like, us not being any sort of authority, like, we're not cops of any sort. Mm -hmm. Um, We aren't armed. Like, none of us, like, one of us had a hunting rifle. So we aren't going to just like back, you know, backwoods justice, these guys. Um, The option was like, what, tell everybody in the town that these authoritarian figures like did it? Like, I don't like it. That's one of the problems that I have in in some of these games is like, what? (laughs) Sure, we could solve the mystery. But what do we do with that information? Like, that, I feel like that's where I got kind of lost in this case is like, Mm -hmm. We have no authority to do any of these people. We could go back to town and say, yeah, we think these people murdered them. But unless we have real evidence, which is kind of like, well, he has his gun. Like, we could have said that, but that's not, that's, I don't know if that's. It's like so circumstantial. (laughs) Right. Like, I don't think, I don't think that's evidence enough to have the cops get on a boat and fly and, you know, and, and row out here and, and like arrest them or do more research. So it's like, what do we, like, the only thing to do is, is like yep we think it's them keep an eye on them and wait for what happened to happen like that's where i run into some problems with mysteries is like like what what do we like i think like if you were doing a a mystery in a game where like delta green where like your your fbi or whatever like Mm -hmm. (laughs) which you could also run the werewolf game and oddly enough um like if you're doing a mystery like that it's like you have the authority to kill them or arrest them like like there's things you could do in vase and it's kind of like well, go look into this problem. Oh, yeah, they probably murdered that guy. Yep, Mr. Priest, you were right. It's fishy. That's kind of a joke, too, with the mermaid. But, yeah, it's it's fishy, but what are you going to do? Do you want to go? She has a mm-hmm. shotgun. I have a knife. 
you know, I don't, I don't. And like, and, and there's a good chance, like the people are going to be like, so <laughs> like, like, yeah. I, don't, I don't know. Like, I just don't know what we're supposed to do at that point. Like, so we solved the mystery. We know that they were involved in this murder or whatever. What do we do now? Well, let's stop them from doing the sacrifice. And we get to the same place. Like yeah, we isn't... wait for them to go up to the island and do. And so like, I, I don't, I don't know. Like that's the, that's another issue that I run into is like, and that was kind of where I was when we found the girl in the, in, in the, in the, in the barrel. I was like, well, we need to take her to the authorities and have them arrested or something. Not like, mm-hmm. what are we going to do in this town that we have? No, no control power. over her. Yeah. Like no power at all. Um, yeah. It, and it's interesting because I because when I but when I went into this and I think this is where my mindset was is I was like I'm going to give it a little light basin and this seems to be a perfect light introduction and I think I had two things that went against me is first of all the fact that we had um, it, the fact that we had a kind of a break due to the holidays kind of made a weekly gaming session hard and we go slow anyways through this stuff but second of all memories were bad so even with like even with trying to do some reminders and stuff like that, it felt like you guys couldn't contextualize these things because, you know, time had made you forget how that piece of the puzzle fit in. Cause it's like, it, it just reminding you that you have a piece of a puzzle doesn't help you solve the puzzle. <laughs> it just tells right, you, it okay, well, you. oh, we did yeah, have that cracked them, coffee cup, you, you know? Yeah. It doesn't help you put them together. Having yeah, pieces so, of put them together. So, so I think that, true. you know, in terms of like, in terms of, you know, post thing here, I really feel like making sure the clues, you know, I, I, I develop those clues a little bit more um, so that you guys understand them and not just feel like that they're just meaningless exposition and all that kind of stuff is important. But I also, I, it, it's kind of funny because I, I feel like, you know, after the holidays, you guys actually had like your thinking caps on and that was like right at the very end of it. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So at the very end, you guys yeah. are like, ah, we're starting to get into the, into the groove here and now we can figure this out. Where in the beginning, I feel like you guys were, were still playing it out. And I feel like, you know, to, to kind of give a more satisfying ending, I think the goal should have been more clearly, clearly called out has to like you know not maybe more like charlie's angels style right where it's just like okay angels your goal is to go do this you know so that you guys at least have a, a victory condition in, in your mind ahead so it's just like go prove that the amundsons are the ones who killed the vicar right and so you go out there with the goal of proving that rather than necessarily prove that it's not a suicide because I think to your point, you know, when you said that it's like, well, it's easy to just go out there and point the finger at the Amundsons because they're like the only named characters in the story, right? It's like you go to a small village of four people and they're all in the same family. Okay, so one of them did it, right? Are we just saying which one did it and we're just solving which one? Or are we just pointing on saying the Amundsons are the bad people, right? You know, so you think, I think having a clearer goal would have been uh, maybe a little bit more on me to do for next time. So I think the next one is going to be a lot more base and heavy yeah i think that'll be good and i think the only other thing is again like what we're supposed to do with that information like Mm -hmm. just saying yeah prove that it's them we'll prove it to who Otto. like okay Otto. you know the oscar what that was the the oscar um i like Otto better oscar um okay oscar you're correct they killed him bye and then we just sail out like like (laughs) i think more i'm more clear on what we're supposed to do and uh, what we're supposed to do like with the information like because you can figure yeah. out a lot of stuff, but if you don't have any power to make an impact, which we really mm-hmm. didn't in this case, in my opinion, I could be wrong. Like maybe somebody else in the party would have had a better idea. Like I don't know, burning their house down or something. Um, but I was trying not to be a murder hobo. Uh, I was trying not to be a murder hobo till the fight. Um, and that would have been the thing. Is like that would have been what. See, we've been out of to think of something like totally off the wall like that. Like. Um, mm-hmm. Well, we think it's them. What do we do to to end their reign of tyranny? <laughs> Burn their house down, you know, something like that. Um, sneak into their, you know, sneak into their house at night and smother them with pillows. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, Very I'm stinky, sure my, seaweedy pillows. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure my, I'm sure my, my hobo sneak abilities intended just for late night assassinations of rich people. Um, but, uh, but that's the thing is like what do we do with the information? Like that, that, and that's always the thing. And maybe that's just me. Maybe I, I'm the one that struggles with that. But like, I think if, even if we would put all the clues together, it would have been like, Oh, well, I guess we're going to keep an eye on them 
and then we would have ended up in the same place. So I think that's a good thing is like, we could have solved it early, but I mean, we would have had to have waited for the finale anyways, because we're not going to arrest them. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you, I don't know. Maybe you guys would have, I don't know. Um, but well, I mean, like, what, say, like, I guess, does, does, does it say what we like, does the adventure say what we should do? Like, who should we tell or what we should do to, to like, if we figure it out, what, what should we, does it say what we should do? Does it give you any inclination of what we should do about the Amundsen's? There's, I think there's some, you know, there's some inclination because, because I, at some point, you know, like, again, you know, it's like, how do you prove that without more, without just circumstance and evidence and all that kind of stuff. And I don't think there's really a lot of good opportunities, but there is something that is really interesting about how they run the game is they have kind of like, like an urgency, you know, like a, a doomsday clock that goes along with that. And, and Oscar, young Oscar was actually your, your prompter. You know, like he was going to prevent you guys from getting lazy in so much as that he was going to go crazy and just part insanity, part just religious fervor. It was eventually going to go ahead and burn down all the buildings on Wrecker Isle, you know, because he had access to train oil and a lighter, basically. Right. So. Right, which, which, yeah, like. I mean, and the way it sounds is like maybe we should have just enjoyed it or like joined him. But I guess that's the thing is like we're we're supposed to prove it's the Amundsen's, but like who are we proving it to? Just just Otto because he's no. not going to do anything. He's not going to do anything other than what he's already planning on doing, which is burn the whole town oh, down. Which where it's okay, like sure. Um, so I guess that's the thing is like what what once you figure it out like what are you supposed to do like in most modern yeah. settings it's like turn them into the cops or or arrest yeah. them if you are a cop or if it's a cyberpunk game you know yeah. or or delta green game it's like well you know what you need to do you know take them out and yeah. bury them and lie like that sort of thing and in Vason, it's more like well we're just kind of like <laughs> paranormal investigators like we're not gonna like well I think I think what your your goal was to again you know your goal was to either convince the Amundsens that you they should stop sacrificing the bodies or or you know you should bring them to justice. I mean, there's a few there's obviously other outcomes. That That's, could have and been. that tells you and that tells you what type of player I am because talking them out of it was not even a thing at the forefront of my mind. Yeah, <laughs> like if we figured it out, well, you should just talk them out of sacrificing people, like. I guess that's one of my failings as a player. Like, I'm just like, well, I don't know. They're, they're villains. You're probably not going to talk them about out of it. So, well, at least not what do we do? Right? Like, <laughs> you know, talk, well, I mean, but, talk but maybe about like, yeah, but maybe like the social aspect of it didn't even occur to me. So, I'll work yeah. on that more for next time. Although my filthy hobo might not be the guy to <laughs> the guy to be spearheading this stuff either. Mm -hmm. Um. He so. seems to think a lot in the terms of, I don't know, steal from him, uh, stab him. Like that seems to be kind of his, uh, his sort of thing, but he is pretty good at stabbing. I was pretty impressed by that. Yeah. Well, and that's, and I think that one final note, because I, I think we're, you know, our, our, we're coming up on the end of this is that, um, is a, is that combat invasion is weird and very spiky, you know, like it can be very deadly, very fast because there's, there's nothing that, you know, if, you, if you're going to do damage to something, it's very likely that you could do, you know, one point of damage and just kind of like nick them. Or you could do a lot of damage and just totally obliterate the thing on the other side. And the only people that seem to be, or the only thing that seem to be exempt from that outcome are the Vason themselves, which just because they have lots of dice to roll, it's, it's unlikely that you would be able to do anything to them. Um, you know, well, I think, I really think, I really think pushing is probably the answer if you have if you don't succeed the first time like my character has the eight dice for combat like I think there's the, you know there's a good chance that he's gonna succeed on one of those dice like the answer is is if he's really in danger he should push because like he's gonna get injured injured anyways so if he's mm -hmm. in a fight he should just push um and I think that's that's really the mechanic of the game that 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 you need to remember is that if you are in a, you are in a troublesome situation where you're going to get hurt anyways, mm -hmm. you yeah. should push your dice. Um, push, push, push. Because I, you're going to, yeah, you're going to, you, you, I mean, it might be, I mean, you might go down a horrible death spiral, but that's going to happen if they start hitting you anyways. 
So, true. Um, it's true. and and my character has the most dice to fight with. I think. I think I eat more dice than our shooty character has to shoot people with. Oh, yeah. I think I, I think if if not more, I think you're like really neck and neck, like um, very very close because he has a lot of dice to shoot with. Yeah. So, so like. Like you just need to like double down on that because, yeah, like you're not rolling many dice and you're gonna fail quite a bit, in my opinion. Like we can yeah. talk about dice average and stuff like that, but yeah. Okay, but it was fun. So, I, thought, I, thought, I felt I felt the climax. I want I want to be clear. I felt the climax was very fun. I did enjoy the climax um, of it. Mysteries are yeah. probably hard for me because I'm just not a very smart man. I'm not very good at connecting dots, apparently. Um. So, uh, okay. but the, but the, but the final, the finale was, was definitely fun. Yeah. And I think, honestly, I feel like, I feel like it was a good adventure to run. I think that as the first face of adventure, it was weak in Vason, but strong in, in other components. So I think this next one's going to be a lot stronger from a Vason perspective. And I think that'll be a good time. And then of course, as, as we know, we're going to probably switch gears a little bit because, you know, we like to play these other games and see what kind of stories can be told in them. Um, so after we're done with our next basin mystery, I did pick up Alien, the Free League RPG. Uh, and so we're, we might dabble in that playing, um, I, Chariots of the God or something like that. Uh, I am excited to die to aliens. Yep. Corpo slave alien bait. I think it's my new favorite character class. <laughs> Um, yeah. yeah, I'm I'm excited to have my head punched through by alien teeth. Well, we'll see. It. I mean, I feel like if we do play a game and I don't pick something that has aliens in it, some people would be very disappointed with my poor life choices. But I, I'll do my best to find a very alien heavy c- cinematic experience for it. Uh, um, I was thinking uh, just just really quick before we close. I was thinking about um, running, like doing, making an alien game. I haven't looked at the rules or anything, but I was thinking it would be fun to do an alien game where it's not an alien killing people at all. It's either some crazy guy on the ship or like uh, one of the robots that has gone insane and is making it look like it's an alien. Like that was mm-hmm. one of the things that I thought would be fun. Um, but again, well, now it might I'm be going different. to second guess every game you run an alien. Just so you know. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes, sometimes it's just an alien. But yeah, sometimes it's just an alien. Yeah. So, so we'll we'll be excited to bring you, um, you know, post mortem, you know, after the facts for both of those games. Um, if if there's interest in us running an actual play, we please let us know because we're not going to do it if you guys don't tell us. Um, and so, speaking of which, uh. So you know, as as we reach the end of the episode, we appreciate you guys listening. Um, we hope if you have any comments, feedback, or just want to tell us your your deepest and darkest thoughts. You can always reach us at rollwiseguys at gmail dot com. Otherwise, you can talk to us on Twitter and a few other social media things that are available in the in the links, and well as uh, like and subscribe on YouTube. Uh, we are posting the audio versions of these on there because both uh, Brent and I are Trogdo delights, and uh, we're also. Yeah. We, are fa- we have faces made for for radio uh someday uh when we have when at least when i have a better uh like face? place where i could <laughs> yes when i have a better face um when i have a better like place or background or something like that uh maybe we could start doing video but um yeah our studio is still lacking a little but um yeah, we've... but yeah minimal investment in the in the studio background so we're we're going to keep on bringing the audio component to this to youtube so like subscribe share i mean do all those things that people tell you to do with that to help us with the algorithm because we don't have sponsors uh this is entirely a passion project at this point we're we're reliant on you guys to help us find other like-minded individuals that want to connect about other games and talk about gaming and in the grand scheme of things and if we can start developing um, a community, we eventually um, would like to get a Discord uh, with people to hang out. Um, mm-hmm. We can talk games with people. So please talk like, games, subscribe, comment. Games. Yeah. So thank you, guys. Yeah. So next week, uh, we're actually going to play, we're going to run through the Pathfinder 2 character creation process as another kind of uh, snub to D&D. So uh, look forward to it. Um, we hope that... Uh, you guys look forward to it and we'll see just how much more rules heavy that system is. Um, But yeah, so Brent, why don't you sign us off? 
yeah thank you guys and as always uh roll wise and roll well and scene <laughs>